We are back again. I know the first one's not going to be saved, but there's some serious technical difficulties. I need to type this back in. We have an interview today with Lisa Finelli. Boom, we are back. Okay, all right. Let's see here. Shout out Chandra in the building. Louis Cons, what up? Well, hello. Hey! <laughs> I don't know what the hell happened. All of a sudden, my phone just froze. It's all, yeah, I don't know what happened either. It, like, it just kept me holding for a, a while, but it's all good. It's all good. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Can you hear me all right? I'm outside because there's dogs in the house, so. Yeah, I hear that. All right, well, I just want to welcome everybody for tuning in to the Leeds Edutainment Podcast, brought to you by Brand Nation Media, Barbara Time, Lifted Productions, and Chubby Chick P. We have a very special guest today. Mrs. Lisa Finelli had, uh, was Dash Fallon now? <laughs> Lisa Finelli Fallon, yeah. Gotcha. Two last names. Better than two yeah. first names. <laughs> Of Experience Creative and Boston Cannabis Biz Week, which is going on as we speak, correct? Yes, it's happening right now. Yesterday we had our uh, our golf tournament, BCW Classic, which was sold out and insane and so much fun. Uh, then last night we had a sports uh, and cannabis panel talking to Paul Pierce, Gary Payton, Ethan Zahn, Dave Briggs, and Mary Jane Stapley. Uh, so today we have our fashion and glass art event, Fashion on Fire, uh, this afternoon. Yep. We also have tomorrow is a full day of education. Uh, both of those events are at Warehouse in Somerville. Thursday is our industry mixer at uh, Western Front in Chelsea. And then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we're over at Underground and Ink Block for uh, the Weed Maps Block Party. Uh, our Experience Boston Music Festival and uh, Experience Wellness for Health and Wellness on Sunday. Do you think you got room? Do you think you got room for one more event? I don't know. I don't know if there's enough going on. I think it's... they might. It seems a little boring to me. We need to spice <laughs> this up a little bit. I don't think everybody knows. <laughs> think you can put any more on your plate, Lisa, or what? I, it's really, it's not <laughs> ideal. And every time this year I get, I go, why? Like, why am I doing this? I can go sit at a desk job and have just a chill life. And, and, but like, yeah, that's not, that's not how you and I are cut. We can't, this is, we I mean, seem to thrive off the insanity. In some this way. is next level though. I mean, I ain't never done no shit like week of fucking events yeah, and I... festivals and shit like all in one week, man. I, uh, how do you do? Are you sleeping? I mean, is there any uh, sleep involved? Kind of, yeah. I mean, but there were times where you were doing five, six, seven shows a week, so you kind of get the at the yeah five five Middle East shows, got <laughs> <laughs> five fucking major festival with that friggin' Paul Pierce and friggin' <laughs> industry and everybody's high. You know what I mean? Like, uh, like yeah. <laughs> so, um, and and the the blessing is yesterday's golf tournament was sold out. Today's events at capacity. People are emailing us. I want to get in. I want to get in. It's full. Um, the rest of the week is trending that way. Every other event we're seeing ticket sales are like through the roof right now because people are excited. They're going to the events. They're seeing everything we have going on. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the talent we're working with, the companies we're working with, there's just a lot of fun things going on right now. Um, and yeah, this whole, so it wasn't, it started off with five events over seven days in 2019. It yeah. wasn't this astronomical amount of events. Last year, going to a virtual program, we did eight events, eight virtual events over a week. And I was like, okay, that's still manageable. And then going into this year, we said we have to do in-person and virtual. So we'll just pack them together. And now that we're here, it's like, wow, that probably... We probably could have scaled back a little bit, <laughs> but we're here now. I'm very blessed. We have a, a huge team that's helping do all this. This is not by any means just me yeah. um, or me and my <laughs> partner. 
Um, so they're the ones that make this all run and that's yourself included. So um, we've been very fortunate to, to bring Ned on to work with Boston Cannabis Week this year, which has been so helpful and really exciting, which is what led to um, kind of the facilitation of the, the festival the way it is. Freddie Gibbs, I love. That was like an obvious, like the minute that that name got brought up, I was like, yes, that's going to work. Um, I'll, uh, Mick Jenkins was someone that I wasn't as hip to and now have a much better understanding of <laughs> the capacity of what that booking is. People yep. are just as excited in our promotion and our talking about it and our and our day to day, you know, in, in the community talking about it. People are almost as excited about Mick Jenkins, if not more. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and then Sky Zoo terminology. People are we're getting tagged about people coming to see terminology from literally all over New England. Like people are literally just got my ticket coming to see term. Don't care about anybody else. So that's, oh, that's good. Really, yeah. So that's really let term exciting. know that. Let term I know will, that. We'll I will. appreciate and that. Sky Zoo live is incredible. We did a show with him back in uh, 2016 at Hard Rock. Amazing. Uh, and then Jasmine Red, this is her last show. Next week, she's heading off to D Dubai to teach to teach music to kids in Dubai as part of a global ambassadorship. The State Department is sending her overseas to do this. So this is her last show before she like heads out, uh, and she's not doing any more shows really for the rest of the year. When is she um, leaving? She's leaving in the very beginning of October. Uh, I believe it was the third, but I must double check on that date. So she's, they're going to send her there. She's going to be teaching uh, music and music history and hip hop to kids in Dubai, like wild. And then she's going to Egypt for a week after that. So that's really exciting that we get to get her before she does all that. And that's Guru great. Sanal is just so much fun. She's incredible. She knows how to rock any room she's in. So that's going to be a good party. Uh, the day before we have, the Weed Maps block party with um, we just added on the Christmas Collective, so they're going to come rock with us for a little bit. And we have DJ Large Child and Super Smash Bros. People are also freaking out about Super Smash Bros. We're getting tagged in a ton of stuff that people are excited to come see them rock live outside. They yeah, that's the block party. There. That's the yeah, Friday that's night. the block party the night before. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but it's yeah, and then Sunday we do health and wellness with Trill Fit. We have Survivor winner Ethan Zahn doing a stretch and warm up, and we're doing an immunity clinic with uh, herbalist Mika Brown. So it's, it's and then I go to sleep for like twenty hours, and then it's like a day of like housewives takeout, <laughs> and like nobody talked to me, <laughs> and that's and, it. And then you start booking next year. <laughs> so this is already we're already like sick because yesterday we were at the golf tournament and i said so my co-founder scott patano we were talking oh. about this and we literally had a conversation like well we got to talk to ned because we want to get this person by january and somebody was like are you guys talking about next year yeah. and we like got caught up in it we didn't even realize he what? was like yeah Go, Go ahead. ahead. I'd like to remind everybody, I'd just like to let everybody know that the Boston Cannabis Week came to me about three months before <laughs> the event was booked with nothing, no artists at all saying, what can you do? Book a festival in three months. Now, your average festival is booked a year mm -hmm. out. As you can see, Boston Calling is promoting their event for May mm -hmm. two months ago. So it was a right. challenge. It was a challenge to get everybody um, coming out of COVID and get everybody on board and book something. And, you know, and it was not always about money. It was about who's available right? and, right. Um, and money. But, but, but the availability played a big part in, um, in getting people. So, it, I mean, it was, it was a challenge. It was fun, but it was a challenge. I will say as a booking <laughs> agent and a talent buyer to book a festival three months before it goes down is not an easy thing. And get yeah. a good lineup, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. we made it happen, and you now it's happen. working. <laughs> it's and I working. think I said, if anyone can do this, you can, and you did. And <laughs> it, honestly, it wasn't that wasn't the intention. We had these venues booked from the year prior. It was a matter of everything opened up in March, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, like okay, we're gonna go, like we're gonna go, like right now. 
And so from March to by the time I reached out to you, and then very quickly it became evident that there was too much happening. We also, in, in addition to Boston Cannabis Week, we also have our creative agency, BCW Beyond. BCW Beyond works with clients in the cannabis space uh, in, in all sorts of area, marketing promotions, product facilitation, website development, social media marketing, all of that stuff. So we have our agency all year long and clients all year long, and then we're doing our week on top of that. So it, all of a sudden it was like, oh, like Boston Cannabis Week is, has to happen now. We can do it. And um, there were a number of other events, in, like festivals, cannabis events that launched very, very quickly, even quicker, quicker than we did. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's definitely not ideal to have to do the bookings that quickly. But it came together, and the lineup's amazing, and I love it, and the tickets are selling, and it's going to be a great show. So, like, what else yeah. can we ask for, right? Yeah. Good weather. <laughs> How's the weather? We're getting like good it? weather. We're getting right, good, good weather. That's good. fine. We took care of that. Um, so I, I think it's very important. Um, you know, you're obviously in a really good place. Is Boston Cannabis is doing really well. I think it's important that people understand where you come from first. You know, like this isn't just something you started. You've been career woman you're, for a long time, and you've been a good business person. And uh, you know, and, and and you're also from Long Island. <laughs> yep. So let's sure talk about Long Island growing up there. Like, what was that experience like in Long Island? Uh, it was, it was different. So I was born in Queens and we moved to Long Island when I was little. I was born mm, in Rosedale. Queens, nice. Rosedale, Queens. Yeah, it's like right <laughs> next to Jamaica. So my, it was a, like my whole family lived on the same block. My grandmother, my cousins, and we all mo moved out to Long Island. They had come from Brooklyn to Queens and then we were all like moving out east. Um, I, Italian, right? Italian family? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Both my parents are Italian. Yeah. Uh, well, we're their second generation. I'm third generation. My grandparents were first. Right. Um, so, yeah. So they're still very, you know, New York, Italian, Long Island, Brooklyn type of people, you know. Oh, yeah. um, and so <laughs> it was interesting growing up. I really started listening to hip hop like 12, 13 years old. I kind of I discovered doggy style and I discovered you know Wu-Tang and I discovered Nas and AZ and all of a sudden my, I was like what like it the what I had like gone through in my childhood some of the things really resonated with me some of the messaging and I was like oh because I grew up in a town that was like very very white very like like upper middle class you know and and my family necessarily wasn't in that same kind of social status. My parents split up when I was really young. We had a nice house, but my mother wasn't working. It wasn't like, you know, we, we, we would be with my dad and things were cool during the weekend. And then during the week we're with my mom and she's literally getting food from the church, you mm -hmm. know, and like, and like powers shutting off and things like that. So mm -hmm. it was a very, it, it was a tough thing to navigate as a child, like seven, eight, nine years old. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, trying to figure out all that. So that was kind of my first attachment to hip hop. It was like, oh, this makes sense to me. I understand getting the light shut off. I understand going to go to get to St. Rose to get food like mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden once a week my mother would have money and then we were eating steak and shrimp on that day. Like, <laughs> Balling on a budget. Right, yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Hundred percent. Um, and so I started kind of having friends in different areas and I would move around a lot. I would spend a lot of time in Queens and Long Island and even as a teenager. And I very started quickly to like realize that I, I kind of felt out of place where I was living. I said, I don't like, I don't want to live there. It's like, it, it was very much, um, a mindset and not everyone. Cause I still have some friends who live there and I've had family there for a very long time, but I kind of felt like I needed out of the bubble a little bit. Um, and then went to college in uh, Connecticut at Quinnipiac University, lived back in Queens for a long time, had a whole other life. I was a media buyer. I got married. It was like, a oh, whole yeah, other I forgot world. about that. Yeah, it was a whole other <laughs> married my high school sweetheart. That shit didn't work out, obviously. Like, you know, so um, there was like a whole life. And then I turned 
30 and I, I uh, ad agency in Boston uh, moved me up here to work for them. And I kind of just had this year of like, I'm going to just say yes to every opportunity that came along. And it was like, I went, started going to music festivals. I started camping. I started doing a whole bunch of things I had never done before. And then I got this job offer in Boston. I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's just go. And uh, that was the best thing I ever did for my life. Literally came up here. I started working in radio then, which is where we met back in, in the, the radio days. And then uh, that was that was a fun ride for a little bit. And then, uh, yeah, I went to work for Leeds Edutainment for a while. Yep. And I uh, was the brand and PR manager, got to work with the sponsors and uh, some of the artists. And it was it, I look back on that time very fondly now. It was almost like we'll never be able to replicate that little crew and that craziness that happened every single day. Also, the time where I met my now husband, <laughs> coincidentally. I would yeah, like to make a comment that that was at a show that I was promoting and he was working, you know, working at the venue and that's how you guys met. And I was even there that night. And I'm actually responsible for a lot of couples that met at my shows and ended up getting married. So Leeds yeah. Entertainment has connected a lot of married couples. <laughs> I'm just saying, and, and you're, you're living proof of that too. So I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that. <laughs> thank you. If I haven't ever formally thanked you, I thank you now. You owe me for that one. Yeah. Karis one and your husband. There you go. <laughs> Actually, do you know what? what's funny? He said to me, you do realize we met at another show one other time Damn. before the show we start. No, it was your show. Bone Thugs? It was Bone Thugs in Providence. And he was walking around with the owner, yep. Don King. Not another Don King. Not that yep. Don King. And he wasn't the he, owner. He was the manager. The manager, right, right, right. Yeah, the, the, and yeah. the Don. Right. One of the security guards walked up to him and said, oh, a pretty brunette is looking for you. And me being the spicy me I am looked at him and said something to the effect of, oh, you must be talking about me. And he was like, yeah, I am. I didn't realize that, that was the same guy until we were married. And he goes, we met once before that day. Uh, still my show. Taking credit. Yeah, still your show. <laughs> so you still get the credit. Well, and yeah. actually... If I remember correctly, that night, because we always went to get to that rib spot after the show, everybody yep. was always hungry. We always got to, we went to that rib like spot. ribs at 1 a.m. <laughs> How about some barbecue? Knock you out. How did I, how I yep. made it back from Providence to Boston with a freaking <laughs> stomach full of ribs? <laughs> Jeez. At, at three in the morning. Oh. It's and fucking... if I remember correctly, you did say to me, he texted me that night and you said something to the effect of that's work. Don't, don't do, I don't know what you do with the security guard, but that's work. Oh, if it and went bad, mind, it would have been ugly. In my mind, the minute you said that, I was like, well, now I have to have sex with this dude because he's telling me I can't. Oh. <laughs> Literally. Uh, I, wish that, I, I, I wish it wasn't work that easy everywhere. <laughs> don't talk to that person. Okay, I'm going to sleep with him. <laughs> Just say no, that to everybody. I got the magic touch. <laughs> that's, that's the leaves effect. <laughs> You'll be married in three years. Three years. There you go. Yeah. But no, it was like, it was just, it was a fun thing. Not to be that like brash, but it was like, it was yeah. funny to me. I remember, I remember kind of having this thought of like, well, I'm just going to hook up with this guy anyway. It's not going to be anything serious. Yeah. Okay. I was wrong there. Yeah. I was wrong about a lot of things. <laughs> So from there, you, you started Experience Creative, right? After that, after, yeah. you know, after you went on your own, you did Experience Creative. And that was, you, you, you wanted to promote shows too. Yeah. I, gotta, I gotta ask, I mean, was it everything you, you thought it would be? It, it's not as easy as you thought. Easy? <laughs> of course not. There was, it was tough. There, I mean, so Experience Creative was like actively up and running for five years. It was a long run. We did yeah. some really good shows, like, you know, Red Man and Nappy Roots and Method Man and Red Man and Boston Common, things like that. We like wow. really excelled on. Yep. Uh, we did a show at the Wang Theater. We got to some of these bigger venues, which is really exciting. Yeah. Um, festivals. At the end of the day, it, like that just, it takes so much out of your life. And all of a sudden, all the shows stopped. And I was doing some, so I was also working with artists. We were doing like, artist services and then we yep. were doing shows at the same time. You're managing artists, correct? 
Um, kind of. Sometimes I was managing. I managed Marcella Cruz for a while. Yep. Um, a lot of the other artists were more contracting me to do specific services for them. Yep. So, but Marcella was an artist that I was managing completely for a few years um, and working with uh, Nelly Pro Tools as well. So he was yep. producing her and the three of us were kind of working together. Yep. Um, but that too, it's like, it gets to a point where your level of success or be, or deeming yourself, you know, successful at the end of the day is tied into somebody else's work. It's not like if like I'm managing an artist, I'm managing Marcella. I'm only ever going to be as successful as she becomes. So you, I end up putting everything in her. So it becomes this like balance of, do I do shows? Do I manage artists? Do I just do contract work? And I kind of balanced that for a little while cause, until I figured out really what I wanted to do. Then coming up against COVID, it was like, all right, well, there's no shows right now. So I don't have to worry about that. The artists didn't have any money coming in. So they weren't doing any campaigns or contracting anyone. Um, that started to slow down, but the thing that remained consistent was cannabis <laughs> that started growing. They were staying open. They had marketing budgets for campaigns and we signed our first agency client like last March and it was doing their whole, and that's mellow and Haverhill. We did their logo design, branding, everything, signage, helping them with, uh, packaging, product sourcing, like front to back, everything. So that started to get really busy. And then all of a sudden, word of mouth, we started getting a lot of people who were like, oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. Suddenly we had like nine clients running for the agency alone. Uh, and then it became, oh, so we have this agency. And then we also were doing Boston Cannabis Week. It was like there was a quick switch where the, the company got much bigger. And that was the moment where I, I, I said, I, I can't do this all. I can't do just booking shows. I can't. I can't manage, I can't, like, I have to start delegating things, which is, as you know, a business owner, one of the most difficult things to do is to trust other people to do what you know has to get done. And Yeah, and, that's and, the and, ultimate you know. goal. <laughs> the ultimate goal is to teach someone to do the job better than you so you don't have to do it anymore. But it's very hard to find the right person. That's the problem, right. especially right. under these conditions these days. But yeah. Right, right. So it almost like the decisions were made for me. You know, Experience Creative was is still exists, but now it's really in a production platform. Like we produce some podcasts along with Boston Cannabis Week, and anything Experience Creative based is kind of tied up in that in the production end of things. Um, but even that, like we have project managers, I we now have account executives, we have people working for us who are managing all of these things. So it's it's a very different business now than even with experience creative and it's much bigger and there's more responsibility and yeah it keeps me up at night from time to time <laughs> that you know that's what people don't understand about business you know everyone sees you know you're the boss or you're the in charge you're controlling or something and you, people want that type of freedom from not being an employee but the reality is it comes with a lot of stress and a lot of worry and a lot of thinking you're never really mm -hmm. off Right. Yeah. Like you're never yeah. really, never really off the clock as a business yeah. owner. You, you, no. Because even if you're not working, you're thinking about something that you got to do yeah. or needs to be strategizing or something. It's tough. Yeah. It's tough to shut it off. Right. There's Sometimes, a tremendous amount of stress. Yeah. With COVID, it leveled me out. So I was like, okay, I'm not really doing any shows. I'm not, everything, everything just was like done. So I was like, Hey, maybe being an employee ain't so bad. <laughs> you know, like I don't have to think about all this, and I was able to not have all that burden. I was like, wow, that's actually not bad. You know, right. it's not a bad right. life. Right? No, it's not. I I actually said to Scott the other day, I I don't I don't know how I got in this position. All of a sudden, it was just kind of there. Yeah. And he's no, like, I mean. you know, it 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 does. It takes a, a huge team of people to make all of the things happen, and I'm still. My brain's still adjusting to that. That yeah. at the at, that's where the transition is from like independent promoter. It's like right, we stay up at night. We're the ones who are like, okay, I got this much in my bank account. I got need this much more to pay the artist. <laughs> like yeah. having those like, oh my god, is this going to happen? Moments. Um, at least now I'm in a situation where I have my business partner. We have a whole team of people that we can go yeah. to when something doesn't go right. Right. So I don't. 
solely carry that responsibility and or stress, you know, yeah, and, that, and that's key. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that, right. that, that's right. the lifesaver, you know, because if you right. did have to carry all that, you'd probably have had a stroke by now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm not going to lie this, this week I've been good. Like I haven't been too, too stressed out. But as the days are going on, I find myself having moments of just like blur. Like, where is the day going? All of a sudden, it's the middle of the week. It's the middle of the day. I, I, hours of time have disappeared with me just messaging, responding to messages about shows, about tickets, about can I, about can I vend? You know, we're still, every day people are hitting us up. Can I come vend tomorrow? It's like, yeah, here's the contract. <laughs> send, us the, send us the payment. You're good to go, you know? So... Um, we're already thinking like this year, so this is going to change. This is going to change. We're not even through the whole week just yet. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited for tonight's event because it's the first time we're doing it. Uh, we're working with uh, uh, Recycle Relove by Lindsay Harper and we're working with Take Flight Strategies and they're bringing in all these, all these uh, designers who work in sustainable fashion. So clothes that are either being recycled or used from sustainable materials um and comparing them with high-end glass art pieces so we'll have glass art around the room these really interesting pieces uh dj real p is spending amandi music is performing so it's going to be a fun event but getting through the, the the next like the rest of the week these are the heavy you know the much heavier lifts um so just but now that it's here we've been doing walkthroughs every single week for months at the festival location and the the three days are the block party the festival and then health and wellness so there's a little bit of a transition day to day but we've been going there every single week with our team just redoing the maps and redoing the layouts and that and, and let's talk about that crazy. let's let's talk about that a little bit what is for those that don't know ever thinking like oh i want to throw a festival let's talk about that because like <laughs> no you don't Let's talk, what is, let's go into some of the stuff that you have to deal with in doing this because it's a lot. It's a lot. I mean, so it's not as simple as walking into a, a venue and saying, I want to do a show. Right. You walk into an existing infrastructure. Right. There already, there's already a sound. There's already lighting. There's already yeah. uh, licenses, permits, food and beverage in place. Nope. It's a totally different ballgame. When anyone says I want to do a festival, it's like the level of having to put a village together on site is I can't even comprehend it. And honestly, this is a big part of where my husband comes into play because he literally maps out everything. He's like, OK, generators, food, disposal, people, you know, he, this is where he shines. And I could not get through this part of it if he wasn't helping on that end. So him, my business partner, Scott Patano, and our security team literally have been plotting this all out. That takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of resources. It takes an understanding of how to create a space from nothing. So um, we had to, it's stage, sound, lighting, fencing, porta potties, portable sinks, sanitation stations, tables, chairs food vendors, garbage, cleaning crew, like, and then you're talking about your licensing, your permits, your certificates of insurance, uh, and never, and then you got to pay for all that. So, and then you also got to pay for the artists. So before you walk into it saying, okay, I can do this, make sure you have the right team in play that is oh, yeah. down to make that all happen with you. Cause we see it all the time. How many times do you see flyers for events and you see the flyer and immediately you're like, this is going to be a disaster. I can just tell by how the flyer is set up and these people are not at all prepared to do what they are claiming they're going to do right here. Oh, yeah. So um, it takes, it takes a lot of planning. We only could have executed this quickly because we had a whole business and infrastructure already in play. We had sponsors and partners and people we were talking to ahead of time. If I had called you three months ago and said, hey, you want to talk about working with us? And we had nothing. This would it would be like Firefest, honestly. That's what they tried to do. They tried to like, how many times you watch a documentary? Because I've thought of you watching. I've watched it, like, it I once. I, I watched yeah. it once. But I, I watched that many times. I thought it was a riot. The guy was just so like crazy. What he was promising. These oh. villages. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was. 
<laughs> on a remote island. Guy's crazy. Crazy. But I, I, he got stuck because he had – the problem was is he had money in, on the line, so he had to go through with it because he had people invested. And it was like he had all these – he just had to try to do it, and it was just like, fail. It was <laughs> Massive what? fail. Yeah. yeah. Biggest and fail like, ever. My fear. That's my fear. I have reoccurring nightmares about you're things not that on could it. You're not in a, you, You've done this before, though. That's the thing is this is your yeah. – you know, last year was virtual because of COVID, but you had done this yeah. a year before. You did this with Lupe yeah. in July, Atlanta. Yep. So you yep. kind of have, I'm imagining that year probably was a little more stressful because yes. you didn't do it yet. You yeah. at least know you have that one under your belt. So now you're like, okay, we can do this. It, it's the uncertainty of not knowing what it is is probably the most stressful, right? Right. right. Yeah. And the expectation of, and this is also, so having the background, first of all, having the background of working in media and then coming and working with you it gave me an understanding of some of how this works. Yeah. So I had, I feel like I had years of training right. before I even launched Experience Creative. I owned other businesses prior, but yeah. Experience Creative was probably the first time I understood how to run a business. Right. And even that, there were times where I'd be looking at things I was doing and, and my husband would say to me, like, you love doing this, but you're killing yourself. Like you're killing yourself getting all these things done Feel is that. it really worth it? I know you're passionate about it, but is it worth it? And so I had all of that got me ready for this. I You can't just jump into let's do a week of events. <laughs> and even with the planning of Boston Cannabis Week, this started because my business partner, Scott Patano, came to the Red Man show I did at Hard Rock. He came, <laughs> we did a meet and greet with Red Man afterwards. And he comes up to me and says, would you be willing? So no, this is funny now that I think about this. Would you be willing to book Method Man or Red Man for the Freedom Rally in three months from now? <laughs> a three month thing. <laughs> you guys in your freaking three months, man. You guys gotta give a little more time. I'll tell you and right I, now. And we did it. Book a festival raised, in three months. I, that was all. Yeah, but we did it. We we raised we the money. We did the show. I mean, the infrastructure for the Freedom Rally was already there, obviously. But let me let me um, ask you because you're really good at raising. You know, and that is such a huge thing. Yeah. So much of, I feel like so much success is based, so much, so many businesses fail because they're under, underfunded. I really believe that. I think there's a lot of yeah. artists out there, talented artists. They should be something, but they can't take the next step because they're underfunded. There's businesses right. that fail, they're underfunded. You have a really good gift at getting things funded. <laughs> How how does how does that work? Like, how did you get good at that? Because <laughs> I um, suck at asking people for money. <laughs> I'm like, dude, can I get five? Bucks? I feel guilty asking my buddy for five bucks. <laughs> no, I I get it. Um, so honestly, it what's started the trick with, to that? It well, remember. So I had this background in media buying. So I ha I had this like background and understanding of that communication of agencies and stations talking about money and values and mm. for 11 12 years so that's mm -hmm. kind of where that started then when i started to understand the correlation between having a product and the value of that product and the value of people wanting to be associated with your product and how to take care of that how to kind of mm. you know get like figure out those numbers right um with, I started doing it a little bit with very little with the radio station is when I started having those negotiations, but I wasn't really materializing much, yeah. just, you know, a little bit here and there. Yeah. Then when I started working with you, I started working with the sponsors and putting people at certain shows. And it even was like more of a, oh, like this show is worth this much to a partner because they're going to get this many eyeballs. Right. And so it even kind of further phone, you know, kind of, honed it in working with experience creative it then became a conversation with artists like okay you're contracting me for this these services this is how much that value is in the beginning that was very low i also had a hard time asking people for what i i was worth especially artists too because artists in the, right. especially in the beginning don't have really any money right right <laughs> and, like... but right it became a situation where i started getting traction with some clients who were a little bit further along Yep. And I had to start making decisions. Am I literally going to take, I have two clients here. Am I going to take the one that's going to pay me half, even though, because they're nice? 
or the one that's going to help me pay my mortgage. Right. So that's when I started having a, it, like, it was like everything got me a little better along the way. And then year one, we had one, like a few a handful of sponsors. MCR Labs was our first sponsor that came on. They've been with us from the beginning. Um, and then we had a handful of people that came to the table, Newberry Comics, uh, uh, a few other uh, Berkshire Roots that came in when we were doing virtual stuff, Western Front. Um, which Western Front is our partner and they're owned, co-owned by Marvin Gilmore, who used yeah. to own Western Front, the dispense, the uh, music venue. venue. Did yeah. a lot of great shows there. Yeah, of course. So uh, we're really excited to be working with them now. That's, that's really cool. But uh, this year going into it, once we started having conversations with potential sponsors, partners, all of a sudden it became evident that what we were doing was very valuable to a lot of people. And, and what is and what is that? What is the value in it? So, our brand, Boston Cannabis Week, the agency, BCW Beyond, yeah, is successful in a number of areas of what it does. We mm -hmm. know how to do events really well. We know how to do marketing. We know how to build branding and design and logos, and we know how to put you in front of the right people. We know how to, we're connectors. We know how to say, oh, you should be talking to this person. You should be talking to that person. Yep. So once we had an understanding of that, it then became, okay, if somebody wants to come and be a part of Boston Cannabis Week, what is the value they're bringing? And it has to be equal or, or more to the, than what we're bringing to the table, right? Like, cause then why do it at all if they're gonna bring less? Right. So, so that's how we started figuring out numbers. And in the beginning, when we did this year one, we were sending out crazy proposals to, to potential sponsors. They probably laughed at it like, Oh, a first year event? Like, really? You think you're going to get that? And I am so happy to say that several of those sponsors came back to us this year and ended up coming on for maybe a lot more than what they would have initially. And these are cannabis sponsors, right? These is everybody in the cannabis community? A little community? of everything. Okay. It's a little of everything. So we have um, some of our partners are dispensaries. Some of them are delivery companies. Some of them are apparel companies, uh, accessories, a lot of fashion and beauty. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's really, a, it, and it's in and out of the cannabis industry, but there is a huge, everybody is kind of seeing the value in tapping into the cannabis industry here right now. There's a tremendous amount of revenue being generated across the state of Massachusetts. And so it, when you have a product that's doing really well and successful and people can feel like they can be a part of that, they're willing to put a lot into it, both not only just financially, but then they're bringing their resources to the table. They're bringing their signage to their people to the table. So yesterday we had a whole village set up at the golf tournament. We had different booths. There was a massage area. You can go get a CBD massage. There was like, Hold up. yeah. CBD massage. How does yeah. that, what is that? What are you, how, what, what are you, what's it, how is it different than a regular massage? So the oils that are used are all CBD. Ah, so you, you, you absorb so the high. Yes. So you're <laughs> absorbing the CBD. It doesn't have any THC in it, but it has the good properties of CBD. So we had that going that on. That sounds fun. Like, yeah, we had this, a weed maps had a giant wheel. They were giving away prizes and all sorts of things. So uh, there was a lounge where people were just hanging out. It was a lot of fun. Um, so doing all of that, though, <laughs> For a golf tournament alone is a lot, and then we're doing that. Do, do people play everything. golf? Do people play golf better high or sober? <laughs> okay, so my Scott has is, used to come from the project management side of things in construction. He said yeah. all the deals happen on the golf course. We're doing a golf tournament, and I was like, honestly, he goes, "We're doing a golf tournament." I always we heard that do, too. We can do just that, and it would be successful. I'm telling you. So, so golf is big. They have a bar, a bar cart that drives around serving alcohol on the course. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah. And if you're also walking around and doing whatever you're doing, and it's a private venue, so our golf course was a private venue. Yeah. So, so you can so walk around edibles. smoking. <laughs> it's weed and edibles and all types we of don't, stuff. We don't ask what everybody's doing. We just make sure they're being safe. That's all we do. That's <laughs> all we do. That's funny. High but, golf. Yeah. 
but uh yeah but they you know we and we gave away some great prizes we gave away a bunch of uh, tickets to yankees red Sox at fenway which i was annoyed because i really wanted to go yeah but yeah. it's during boston cannabis week so it can't uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um and then we gave away bruins tickets we gave away um uh a bunch of rounds of golf one of our sponsors was doing free haircuts for a year like crazy so we gave away all that stuff yesterday that's so funny yeah i mean it's amazing like i stopped smoking weed 12 years ago but i smoked a lot sold a lot of weed but uh <laughs> the the evolution of weed and cannabis to what it has come now versus what it was is huge it's crazy mm -hmm. Back in the day, you'd make yourself a weed brownie. You know what I mean? Now, <laughs> nowadays, it's edibles and custom candy. I got to be careful not to eat weed when I go to certain places because I never know what's in things. I used to go over Sammy Gerber's house. He'd be like, yo, don't eat that over there. That's got weed in it. <laughs> this does it. I was like, how do you know? <laughs> Sammy Gerber, man. Is Sammy Gerber involved in any of this stuff? His high-ass blunt Gerber. man, Sam? Um, so his company was playing golf yesterday. He was not there, but he uh, was playing, they were playing golf. Yeah. And we have a mutual client now, which is very funny. So we both work with Mello. He works in staffing at a cannabis, uh, a cannabis staffing agency. Yep. So they place people in different dispensaries and yep. ancillary companies and things like that. So now we have a mutual client. So just a, a few months ago, we had a job fair at the location, Mello in Haverhill, and we're standing back there. And I was like, we just need Ned here to feel like we're back on stage in Middle East. Yeah. Jake. <laughs> yeah. And Jake. Oh, Jake was good. Jake was, was someone that was really, really passionate about what he was doing with you, you know? Yeah. 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 He, he started working with me when he was like 18 years old, 17, I think. I, don't, I forget how young he was young, though. That's wild. Yeah. He's doing finance now. Shout out Jake Milo. Well, this <laughs> is great. Jake. Well, this is great, Lisa. I mean, we're really excited for the festival this Saturday. I'll be there. Oh, trying not gosh. to get a contact high. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I'll be there. <laughs> it's so fun. Yeah, so we have um, – um, we're going to post the set list that is now finalized a little later today. Yep. Um, so everybody can check out what that looks like. We are packed with vendors. There's going to be a, a game area. There's going to be uh, – Western Front is setting up a whole lounge uh, the VIP area is really nice this year. Uh, there's a big, uh, some people are bringing giant Jenga games in. We have water pong. We have connect four. There's going to be connect light up four, things. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> there's like, there's like things everywhere to do. Anywhere you walk, there's going to be things. And are, are people allowed to just smoke weed wherever? Okay. So <laughs> here we go. Social consumption is not yet a thing in the state of Massachusetts. Ah, social consumption. Yes, that is not a thing yet. What here. exactly does that mean, social so, consumption? In, when the legalization passed in the state of New York, the law says that you can consume any type of marijuana, inhale, eat, whatever, anywhere that you can in, uh, smoke cigarettes. So if you can smoke cigarettes there, you can smoke weed there pretty much is is the verbiage you know it's much more complicated than that but that's where, what you can do in the state of massachusetts it says that you can only consume smoke whatever in a private residence or a private property it can't be in public space so gotcha. that's what the law says yeah yeah is that it and that's it <laughs> all right no we listen <laughs> If you walk into any venue in the state of Massachusetts, I don't care if it's if it's uh, uh, the old what is it Leader Bank Pavilion, the old Bank of America Pavilion, any of the outdoor areas where there's concerts going on in Massachusetts, people are smoking weed. So that's what's going on right now. So well, I've like had a freedom just... rally for years, right? There was the freedom rally. Which isn't right. going on this year, right? Correct. It, it actually just happened last Saturday, but it was announced almost the same week. Oh, um, so I remember when they, we first talked, it was like that wasn't yeah, happening. It was not happening. They announced it last week, and they did have a uh, Immortal Technique come perform. Okay. I heard. I was not there. I had no idea. Yeah, it was not. They only put up a few Instagram posts about it. Yeah. So um, it wasn't a lot going on. But also, the Cultivators Cup just happened in Somerset. Yep. People were doing whatever they were doing there. It was fine. Our 
our our venue is a private rental. We're mm. renting that, so it's it's a pri it's considered a private venue. Um, but the anywhere you go, you see someone's walking down the street smoking. People aren't really get a, getting arrested for consuming where they shouldn't be right now. I have at least I haven't seen that happen. I can't, you know, um, is is I don't know about the rest of the state, but what is the dispensaries are open in Massachusetts. Is it right. just medical or is it medical no. and recreational? Medical and recreational is open. It is both. Now. Yeah, it is both. Okay. So you, if you have a medical card, then it, it, you're enabled to get certain discounts and things because there's no insurance. Yeah. Um, it, otherwise you could just walk in with a ID and go buy at a, any adult use dispensary in the state yeah. of Massachusetts. Okay, I wasn't sure if it, they, I knew it was medical. I didn't know when it switched. It was also recreational. Oh yeah, a while ago. Yeah, oh okay, a long cool. Time ago. They they've been up and running for. I mean, the rollout here has been strange. They have to go through a really long process before they can open their door doors, and the process has many holes and flaws in it. Yeah. So, yeah. um, uh, but it is both in the state of Massachusetts right now. So, and social consumption will be coming. The city of Somerville is actually going to be the first ones that have said yes, they will allow it. But the venue has to file for a permit. You have to have an outdoor designated space. There's a, a few different caveats to being able to do, like, say, a lounge where you can go and legally consume. So Got it's it. coming. It's coming. It's just, yeah. It's all well, I, yeah. I mean, I remember Denver when I flew out to Denver to visit Sammy when he first went out there. It was like a dispensary every other block. It was yeah. too many dispensaries. There was more dispensaries than freaking general stores, convenience stores. Yeah. It was like that crazy. Yeah. Uh, Colorado crazy. was really ahead of it, I think. Uh, it was ahead of everything. So if we end up looking like Colorado, it's going to be crazy. <laughs> well, there's a weird thing happening right now. So California, Colorado, California especially has the opposite problem. I still believe that at the end of the year, there's a certain amount of product that they burn off like just weed that they burn off because they can't sell it, can't carry over past certain date. Weed expires? So, so well, when it goes through all this type of <laughs> processing, it does. It's like I know a lot of people that would take some expired weed no, for it's free not, it's, and, and, and not being, have it burn it off. No, it's beyond being expired, but there's a reason, there's a reason they burn some off every year. Massachusetts doesn't have that problem. We have the opposite no. problem. We don't have enough people <laughs> who are just growing. So there's a lot of places that are growing it and then selling it. They're, they're vertically integrated. There's not a lot of companies that are just growing. There are more coming on board every day, but we're only starting to see first and second harvests from those growers. Mm -hmm. So you have these delivery companies popping up. You have these other companies that just want to sell it, but not grow it. Yeah. There's not enough product right now Seems so like that's, that's the common theme with a lot of things like whether it's by construction building is not enough product cars right. there's not enough product yeah but it must yeah. be covid yeah <laughs> it, it it could be a part of it i think the biggest thing in massachusetts is the way that the whole legalization rolled out like uh, there were so many flaws in how this whole plan was laid out to begin with i think that was a big part of what needs to get figure out someone right wrote now. grown by green wrote over 1 million square feet of unlicensed space what does that yeah mean? yeah so unlicensed space there so i believe and grown by green jump in if i'm incorrect but i believe what he's what they're referring to is uh having space that has not yet been licensed to grow marijuana so you have a lot of places that are in queue to become licensed to Pending. become a legal grow facility so that is taking up a lot of time. It's taking up a lot of energy resources. There were, so a lot of these places, you have to have your location first before you can apply. So you, you have to go get the building and pay the rent or buy the building before yeah. you can even start this process. Yeah, there's a lot, so, of, there's a lot, of, it's a big expensive investment, millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, right. it's a tremendous financial ex to open a dispensary. That's the new, it's funny because what I'm seeing now, we, we were joking around the other day that like at one point, everyone knew a ton of people trying to become a rapper. And now the new thing is like, everyone's going to open a dispensary. Everyone, you know, is going to open a dispensary. It's like, listen, it's another thing. Good luck. 
write the business plan, make sure you have your insurance, your LLCs filed, all of those things before you can even fun begin stuff. to have them. Real the fun, fun stuff. stuff. Yeah. 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 That's the other thing people don't realize when they start the business. All the little minutiae details that you got to do, man. This shit's so draining. It's so boring, but you have to do it. You know, it, it's worth it if the business does well. But, man, like a lot of people can't do that type of admin shit. You know what I mean? They're good at one thing, but that stuff, licensing, filing, da 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 sucks. Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> I, we literally this we said next year that's the first person we're hiring next is somebody to just take the admin stuff off my plate because oh, it's I, it's it's gross I can't yeah. it's so much kills all the creativity kills all the creativity yeah. I'm not doing any of the fun stuff I like to do because I'm filing paperwork and licenses and bank statements and <laughs> it's like this is not fun guys <laughs> but I'm you have to do it fun. that's the thing especially you know for me a small business owner I do everything so it's like. Yeah. Not on the level that you're at, but even that level sucks. Yeah, right. <laughs> and being an ancillary cannabis business is a whole nother set of problems. We actually just last week had our payment processor shut down permanently because yeah. we work with dispensaries. So that, so now they we had a bunch of payments incoming from, from partners and, and vendors that were returned. And they call, and then they emailed us and said, "We you can't use our platform anymore because you work with dispensaries." And that's funny because I've seen that because I, I do digital marketing on Facebook and Instagram, mm -hmm. like we've talked about. They will not let you do anything cannabis related. Um, right. So there is a lot of people fighting up against cannabis still. I mean, even the former mayor Marty Walsh was very adamant about no pot shops. Yeah. So there is still. It's legal, but it's not legal. It, it's just like this gigantic yeah. gray area. It's like, yeah. and that's not really a good place to be when it comes to policy, in my opinion. You got to be one. You got to be like one way or the other. So right. it's kind of confusing if it is legal or not because it's. Can you yeah. explain that so a little bit? Federally, it's not legal yet. It is legal in the state of Massachusetts, and I believe we've just hit the point where it's legal in as many states as it is illegal in this country. Um, I would have to go back and look at the latest change, but I believe we're pretty much there. Um, so whenever you have an organization that takes any type of federal funding at all, they get very scared about working with the cannabis company. With the, with the finance part of this, there's a whole nother set of problems because banking is an issue. Um, being able to just set up an account, we, it took us a long time to be able to set up a business checking account. For the very, very fact that we had to go through, it was like literally weeks and weeks and weeks of paperwork showing different licenses. Um, they wanted a year's worth of bank statements, a yep. year. Like just doing those things day to day became really, really difficult to navigate. Um, so once now, yeah, we have our bank account and our bank, thank God, is like cannabis friendly understands we're an ancillary business. We don't even touch the plant directly or any cannabis products. We just do events and marketing and promotions and all of those things. Um, but now there are some, some legislation in play that's going to help to change those things over. But people can't even get accounts open quickly. You can't yeah. just go into, into a bank and say, I'm a cannabis company, I want an account, you have to find the ones that will accept it, that will be willing to work with your company. Then they're doing background checks on you. They yeah. want to make sure that you haven't like dipped out on other banks in the past and all these things. Yeah. It, it, it's a lot. It's a lot. And so, and then having my company is a LLC and we have two, two owners. So then they want, they do that on both owners yep. and they, and they go through and they're like taking background on all of these things. Yep. Um, but I do believe federal legalization is going to happen in the very near future. Once that happens, we're, there's going to be this rush where people are going to, going to suddenly flock to this industry on another level. So even though we're seeing the craziness we're seeing now, we're not even in the, in the craziest part of it. The minute federal legalization hits, you're going to have these national things, national movements and national things happening um, instead of state by state kind of how it is now. It's crazy. It's crazy that, you know, crazy. we've come so far, you know, 
to get to this point. I mean, I always <laughs> grew up with, like, you know, if you, you get arrested for a dime bag, you know what I mean? Like, or a joint in your yeah. friggin' a roach yeah. in your ashtray. I know. That's you know what I mean? Like, we used to get, as kids, we would get arrested for roaches in our ashtray. Arrested? <laughs> we would, I don't I mean, going to some dark alley to a sketchy dude in a car to go get a bag of weed? Like, it wasn't, it, you, I don't even think it's comprehensible what was happening in 1991, yeah. trying to get weed out there. Like, it was a whole nother ball game, yeah. you know? So the fact that we, it's a blessing, the fact that I can go into a store and get product and come home uh, that's what we've been fighting for all this time right the ability to be able to do that many many arguments can be said there's still a lot of people very against it yeah, I cause, the mindset yeah that, it, like, because it's more expensive now because it's getting taxed that's getting the downside taxed. well but if you, you don't budget. have if you have a medical <laughs> card it's no tax is it still more money though you end it's so you get the same product without the tax. So but is it less. is it still more money though? Than you on the street? It can't be more money than on the street. So, uh, so it is more no, money. No, not when with the when you have a medical card, you get so many different incentives that it makes it pretty close to street pricing depending on where you are. So what do you get? Like a cannabis rewards card, you know? <laughs> pretty much thirty dollars. Thirty percent. I get so many points. You get one of those like CVS, CVS long receipts, yeah. and then they you get five in. bucks off your next purchase. Yeah, they're like Mrs. <laughs> Fallon. You have five dollars off your cannabis. Would you like rewards. to use your cannabis rewards card? And I'm like, purchase? yeah, use that, bitch. <laughs> please. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, it's it's crazy times, you know. Like I said, because I was talking to somebody, and he was like, "Yo, man, prices are too high." You know what I mean? <laughs> You know, it's hurt my business, and I was like, "Oh well, you know, mm. you won't go to jail though, because I've I've been uh, I've been almost gone to jail for weed, like literally, yeah. literally jail. Like I yeah. was facing two to six for three pounds of marijuana. That's crazy. So that's crazy. Yeah, and nowadays it, it, it's you know, luckily I beat the case and it didn't happen, but you know, it's good to see that the court systems hopefully will be freed up. <laughs> yeah. With well, everybody, and I hope that they uh, release everybody that has gone to jail or expunge all those records for people yeah. that did get pinched for weed back in the day too, because it's ridiculous. Yeah, that's a whole <laughs> other thing. There's so many people that are sitting in bars right now. There's yeah. we're living in a country where there's people getting very rich because of cannabis right now, yeah. and there's people literally sitting in jail because of it. Yeah. So we have. I to should kind of be. I bridge. should have been in jail. The right. grace we of God, the grace two. of God, I did not go to go jail, but I should have been. Technically, right. should have been. Right. Yes. So my business partner, Scott, he did go to jail for weed. Um, I, I don't know if it was Massachusetts or New Hampshire. He lives up that way. Um, but probably that was one Hampshire. of the re Yeah, probably. <laughs> it was one of the reasons that he was so passionate about this in the, in the first place. He was the yeah. one who said to me, when we did the Freedom Rally and we booked the talent for the Freedom Rally, he said, we should be doing a week of events. Like he was very, at the time he had been to New York fashion week a bunch of times. And he yeah. said, if we should do something that's modeled after New York fashion week, but like cannabis and make it Boston. And I was yeah. like, all, all right. Like I, I, again, I kind of just walked into it. I said, that sounds like a good idea. Like, yeah. Okay. Now I'm in it. Here we are. Yeah. So, yeah. um, but yeah, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of, of, of weird gray areas and loopholes that people are operating under right now. There's major Let's corporations, <laughs> right? There's major corporations. So one of, one of the, the multi-state operators very recently sued the city of Cambridge because they were allowing social equity and EE applicants, the ability to go first. And this MSO, this multi-state operator didn't like that and sued the city of Cambridge and won and got the right to open. And then they're out here saying, oh, we're, we support small business. We support. No, you don't. You literally do not. You literally sued over it. So there's a lot of that funniness happening. And, and we're seeing a lot of out-of-state players coming into town. Uh, I'm seeing that every single day. And they ha think they People have an understanding. People they all want, want in. in. They want an understanding. And they think, oh, I'm going to get rich. I'm going to get rich. This is such a, I'm going to get rich. And it's like, ah, good luck. Good luck. You we could. never got into this for that reason. You could, but you could not. It could be three years before you open. Yeah, you're going to have to put up a lot of upfront money. Yeah, it's a tremendous amount of capital 
yep. people. And you have to want the same thing for that long. And like, there's a lot of things that could happen in the course of three years of your life that would say, okay, I want to open this dispensary. I'm passionate about it. This is what I want to do. And three years later, you are no longer in that same position. So then, you know, all the time, money and energy invested into that, you have to be willing to let go. So there's a lot of letting go happening. <laughs> like you have to, I probably, if, if anything, this working in the cannabis industry is very similar to working in the music industry. Except really? I think now more, on probably the, a lot more money floating around than the music industry on our level. On our level, there's more money. There's a lot of drama. There's a lot of that same like crabs in a barrel bullshit, Boston bullshit that happens specifically here. But I think I specifically have gotten a lot better at understanding that it's, it's not personal. Like they're trying, if, if, if somebody is out here either, either speaking badly about me or trying to replicate something I've done, I should take that as a compliment either way. Cause they're investing their energy in me. So it, it's, that is hard because, you know, coming from the music business and like feeling like it's all personal, especially when it's all yours and you pay the bills. Yeah. Not. I mean, there's like, it comes down to like, you know, you, you need to defend yourself, right. In your business. Yeah. And you don't want to, you know, you don't want to be bad. You don't want the, the language, the, the message out there to be bad. about right. you. So you try to fix right. it and defend yourself. But at the end of the day, you know, someone speaking negative about you, there's not really much you can do about that. Right. And, and <laughs> this is, I feel like Boston Cannabis Week is bigger than I am at this point. There's a very large team involved. It's not my it's not my show anymore. And once I got to that point, it actually became very freeing right. because it essentially, yes, I am the co-founder and yes, I am a, a partial owner. Um, but it means that at some point, my my position is going to change within the company. And it makes it easier for me to delegate. It makes it easier for me to bring other people in. And, right. and that trust, trust is a tough thing getting into this. Like you have to trust that these people are, love it as much as you do. And they're going to do the same thing that you would do and treat it like theirs. And they don't always do that. So that's no. tough. Yeah, it's, um, tough. it's tough to have people you know, do, do something other than what you wanted them to do. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> So that's even the today, that's that's I, the let go. That's the letting go. That's the letting go. That's, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, what? and I think we're I don't know about you, but just having age is like helped a little bit, having a little bit more perspective on this is not life or death. This is not like what like what I've gotten better at saying, what's the worst that can happen? Literally playing that out in my mind and then it's out there and it's gone. And then yeah. it's like, okay, well, why keep worrying? Because I literally just thought through what's the worst that can happen. And no one died at the end. So, well, yeah, know. that was the tough thing about shows. Because when I pictured the worst thing that could happen, it was pretty friggin' bad. You know, right. people be like, Yo, you know, like, because security, you know, with concerts and hip hop shows, you know, someone gets shot or stabbed. You're screwed. Right, right, <laughs> right. You know? So, That's, you know, when yeah. we would get threats or whatever or all flagged for this and flagged for that it'd be like oh shit you know like what's gonna go down you know that was the, draining yeah that that was tough i will tell you in all the shows that we did over the years there were only two that i was like this is a scary situation one of them was that fucking stitches show that i was like when the crowd f turned suddenly and then they weren't happy we all left the room and i was like this oh. is not fucking good no, well, stitches was stitches was yeah. annoying. I wasn't too worried about that one, but yeah. you know, other than him, right, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm worried about up. him. Wait, can we talk about how he showed up driving his own tour bus and left it in the middle of the road in Cambridge? It threw me the keys to move it. <laughs> it Fifteen, the venue is going to shut down in twenty minutes. He shows up. Parks it in the middle of the road, blocks the whole Brookline Street, throws me the keys and says, yo, just park this thing for me like I'm the valet of the tour bus. Uh... I'm like, I don't know how to drive this damn thing. I go in the back. I was like, does anybody know how to drive this bus? Everybody's like, I ain't even got a license. <laughs> we got. Luckily, the security guard had like a, one of those commercial. Uh, yes. CDL. He had CDL. A CDL. He moved yeah. It. Yeah. Then Stitches and gets on it. stage. Who's got cocaine? Right. Right. <laughs> it's like, right. 
No. I had to like no. tell someone jumped on the stage. I was like, no, get back no in the crowd. Do <laughs> not give away any cocaine. After waiting for hours and hours and hours. Yeah. It was 20 minutes before lights were off. And then one of the other Bone Thug shows got a little nasty, but that wasn't because of the audience. That, that was, was because they couldn't get their business together at the end of the night. Someone, someone did something wrong. We won't say yeah. any names. Yeah, someone did something wrong, and then I, I very innocently got called yeah. to talk to another yeah, you handled counterpart. That, you handled that very well because that was a really sticky situation. I wasn't that even was, there, and you handled that pretty good. I, that was a sticky situation, and I that was the only other time that I was like, this dude is about to punch me in my face. Like, yeah. literally. And I was just like, I'm going to let you guys. Yeah, it wasn't your fault. It wasn't anybody's fault except the people in that crew. Little, I don't people like... in that crew's fault. Oh. Right, 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 right. I think we're a little about the your, your yeah. reception's a little in and out here. You are better? Yep, I can see you now. All right, cool. Well, at least you know we're gonna wrap this up. This has been great talking to you. A lot of a lot of good information on this, and I'm all looking forward to this Saturday, the Boston Cannabis Festival featuring Freddie Gibbs, Nick Jenkins, Sky Zoo, Terminology, Grusinal, Jasmine Red, and a few others. I think I got everybody right. We got everyone, yeah, yeah. and we have. Uh... Miss Hot Sauce co-hosting and Hot Lauren Prey Cannabis Barbie co-hosting. Nice. So it's going to be super fun. We're going to be giving away stuff all weekend long. Literally cool. just giving tons of stuff away. So it's going And to that so is this fun. Saturday, Underground Ink Block, Boston, mm -hmm. Massachusetts. Um, if you don't know where that is, you can look it up. It's really easy to find. It's still tickets yep. available. So come on yep. down. Uh, VIP is almost sold out. There's a bunch of tickets available for Saturday. Friday is yeah. moving along. Get your passes for that, too. Download the Weed Maps app. Uh, you can get all your tickets and the full schedule at bostoncannabisweek.com. And, uh, yeah, come out, support. Come see a really good show. It's going to be so much fun. I'm. Uh, thank you for having me on, Ned. Absolutely. Thank you for all your support and for being a part of the Boston Cannabis Week family. Everything you've done for us just means the world to us. So I'm, I'm glad it all worked out the yeah, way it did. Yeah, thanks, so. thanks for bringing me on. I really appreciate that. Yeah, which I had to say, we're going to put it all out there, was may not have happened a few years ago. We both, <laughs> Probably not. We both had a little bit of, a, of a, a moment where we were a little standoffish, but I'm very happy and proud to say we got past it. Now we're, we're back where we belong, doing Absolutely. fun stuff together. Well, that's great, Lisa. Thanks again. And I want to just thank everybody for tuning in to the Leeds Edutainment Podcast, brought to you by Brand Nation Media, Barber Time, Lifted Productions, and Chubby Chickpea. Thank you, Lisa Finale Fallon, and I will see you Saturday. Thank you. I'll see you Saturday. Have Take a good care. day. Bye.